for you this morning. Uh, John Longenecker. You got it. I got it. From MBT Solutions uh, is our first presenter. Uh, we have Jeff and Matt will follow. Uh, Bill Timmons. I saw Bill here somewhere.
Um, so right from the ground up, they wanted to say, hey, we want to be able to use our smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, whatever. We just, we just want it to work. Um, so this is really important for fishermen who go out in the, you know, out in the ocean um, to be able to pull out their phone and be able to take an observation. So after we've kind of looked, you can see here we have a location uh, section here. If you press this button, you'll use whatever uh, location service that the device has on it. So like for example, if I do it on my laptop, it's probably going to use like um, the IP address and try to determine our location that way. On a phone, it's going to use a GPS. Um, so, uh, so you see it has a flat lawn here. Um, so next, um, you're going to want to pick a, a measurement type. So um, they, the client wanted to split up these into different categories. Um, so these are the categories that um, the client wanted to use. Um, so let's say we want to do a, a sky measurement. So an example of a sky measurement would be like, a, say it's 40 degrees outside. So they enter that in. Um, let's say that's the only data we're going to enter in. And they click this submit observation button down here. Um, then they're asked to submit the observation um, through a login. So the, the point of having a login is so that we can track which users are submitting data. So um, earlier I mentioned some different types of users. Um, so there's like students. So students kind of uh, have that user type attached to it. There's also fishermen. There's also teachers, scientists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That comes in handy a little bit later um, when we want to graph our data or show it on a map or filter the data. So, And then you actually get to pick from a list of an investigation. And investigation is just a way of kind of organizing and grouping the data and having a discussion or asking questions around this data. And that's kind of where um, I think the interesting things happen with this project. But uh, in a talk we heard yesterday, um, some people were asking about how do you get offline to mobile? Uh, work in a you know a browser web app. You know it's, a, it's definitely a serious problem. We've had to address it, and uh, I raised my hand in that uh, that session yesterday and put a shameful uh, shameless plug for my talk I'm doing today. So I don't know if anyone's here from that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, so to get around the offline mode, we have something that we have some technologies that actually load the the files for the web application on your phone. So that you only need to visit the site once, and it will download all the code on your phone, even though it's not like a, a native app. And then if you revisit it, um, the app will still load and, and function. So, um, so what would happen if we were in offline mode is it would allow you to enter all your data in, but at that point when you're going to log in, it would just say, you know, you're in offline mode, we'll, let, we'll save this, um, this observation on your phone locally, um, and then at a later time you can go in and submit it. So here's a screenshot of what it would look like if we had some observations that we took and it was saved locally. So I would just pick one of these and then it would actually pre-populate all these forms that we had entered earlier and then you would just hit the submit observation button and then it would just submit it. So you need to go through and do it when you're online. So it's pretty neat, it was some HTML5 um, Stuff, so. All right, so the aggregator. The aggregator is just the central server that uh, stores all the data. It also provides an API to be able to access this data. Um, right now, it's only taking user-submitted data, but in the future, we want to be able to make it so that we can use um, get information from like movies or weather stations or other sorts of uh, other sorts of things. And that's kind of been planned into the creation of it, but we haven't implemented that yet. So. We have, a, we have a gallery here. Um, I'll pull up the live example here. So we have a gallery. The gallery is just showcasing individual observations. Um, and this is kind of more for the, the social aspect of it more than the science side of things. So we can see that we have some users on here. Actually, I just loaded this um, this morning so we can kind of see some data. Um, let's see here. OK, yeah, right here. So someone actually submitted a, a photo. Um, and you can see someone has already liked it. Um, on the 11th, and you can actually comment on an individual observation. Um, so maybe from a scientific standpoint, looking at one kind of observation isn't that interesting. But it's trying to help children get involved with the local community of you know uh, of people. So we also have some filtering here and some date ranges. So you can also uh, you know organize by user or date, um, so, which you know is useful. Um, so here's the map. I have to show a map, right? Um, so uh, I submitted some observations earlier um, for my laptop. And uh, if we look here, it says 
too, because we're using this clustering approach so that you don't, you know, sometimes having, you know, a million points in one spot isn't that useful. So, um, so if I click here, I have two observations: one I made this morning, and one I made uh, when I made uh, yesterday. So if I click one, um, it's going to list the, all the different observations that we have on here. It'll also, if there's a video or image, it'll show up on here as well. Um, and just like the gallery, you see the uh, the filtering options are just the same as before. So, all right. So next we have the graph. So we can actually graph the data, which is um, you can compare up to two different, um, either two different schools or two different users, um, and you can filter it. Date, you know, and then you also can pick up to two different types of uh, data that you want to compare, um, and it just graphs it on there. It's a graph, right? Or what else I can say. Um, <laughs> um, so here comes the social networking aspect of, uh, of the project. Um, so these are, you know, I mentioned investigations earlier. This is a list of some of the investigations that the Weather Project has. Um, so if I go here, this is one um, called the Bycatch Investigation. Um, and if we go here, I'm trusting the Wi-Fi. Um, I haven't had to do that yet. but. Um, so we got, uh, it's a list of uh, uh, discussions happening on this particular investigation. So you see we got a bunch of members, there's a coordinator that kind of oversees and moderates things. Um, but, uh, so you got all these individual uh, discussions, but let's say we wanted to look at number of male green crabs. You know, I'm sure you guys are all wondering about those. Um, uh, so here's a list of uh, comments. Um, you can see that three people liked it. Um, and uh, you can see a bunch of different users taking place on this and you know, seeing how old some of the content is on there. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so that's, that's the social aspect side of things. Um, and then we actually have an entire site um, that kind of pulls everything together that allows us to be able to access all these different things. It manages like user accounts, like when you saw me logging in earlier. That's what's managed through the social network site that we made. So, all right. So some of the, the major technologies that we've been using um, for this project is Leaflet, um, Postgres, PostGIS, JavaScript, Groovy. Has anyone heard of Groovy before? I had never used it before I worked on this project. So um, uh, PHP, uh, Elv, which is an open source. Um, social networking system, so we've had to heavily customize it, but that's what we use, so we didn't have to like create this whole thing from the ground up. D3, um, which allows us to use the graphing portion of things. Um, that's in JavaScript, but it takes use of, uh, makes use of a lot of HTML5 technologies to make it really easy to graph different points. Um, and then to actually host the application, we use two different things. We use Heroku, um, and we use Amazon EC2 uh, as well. So, you know, for any of you that actually care about the technology of that. Um, and then I did the slides in something called uh, Reveal JS. So you know the slides are in JavaScript, so you should All right, so does anyone have any questions on things? What was Ruby? Ruby, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, it is a, it's, it's Java, but it's like a scripting language for Java. So it has, it works really well with Java. So if you have, if you're a Java shop and you do a lot of stuff in Java, this is kind of the benefits of a scripting language, but it allows you to easily work with things that are already made in Java. So a guy that was working on the project before I started wrote it in Groovy, so that's where that part came from. The aggregator actually is written in Groovy. So, yep. Uh, yes? I'm interested in other science, but at that point they're going to need to be able to submit data to take observations. So they want children to learn what's the importance of taking, you know, observations um, and then being able to go through the kind of the whole workflow of what it is to, you know, to perform scientific operations and looking at different investigations on it. So that's kind of the, the underlying thing that they're trying to achieve with it. And we use technology to try to make that process, you know, work as smoothly as we can. It's so like automatically generating graphs. That's that's awesome. Like they want to be able to compare and look at okay, this school in Alaska's 
you know, temp air temperature compared to mains at this time, or we can compare sea, temp you know, sea temperature and air temperature and see maybe how that affects lobster populations. Um, so uh, the, the key thing is to, like I said, teach the children about science um, but, uh, and facilitate communication with the local community. So that's, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this a collaboration tool that you basically provide to a school? Oh, you're right, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, so schools are using this, right, and we want to provide, you know, uh, allow people to be able to collaborate and stuff, exactly, yeah. We're, and we're facilitating that through the, the social network aspect of it, so. Yeah, sorry if I rushed through that. I'm trying to, you know, make use of my 20 minutes well. But yeah. is, it, is there a thought that young kids will will use it more because there's a social networking aspect to it, and, and there's an app on top that's an app? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all the, we throw all the buzzwords out there, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, you know, let me let me let me show the site live here. So we have a, we have people here, and if you look, um, I'll put the people section, and we're going to go down to. Uh, Let's go to students. That should be that all these students made their own accounts. So like onion peats, banana peats. Um, so I don't know if each classroom did a different theme. Um, so you see the kids kind of made their own account, submitted their own um, you know, photo um, that they wanted to do. Uh, let's see here. So I'm just going to put a random user here and see. So you can actually see um, the activity that this user has had. So this person talked on a message board. Um, if they, yeah, here we go, they created an observation 15 days ago. If I click that observation here, this is the observation page. Um, 48 degrees Fahrenheit, wave height, no wave height, and the comment, the comment is, we saw fish. So, <laughs> probably a kid wrote that. Um, <laughs> um, so there's kind of, I don't know if that gives you a little glimpse into how kids are using it. So, ab you're, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. The second group gave me permission, it's okay if I go over into their time, so. All right, let's see. Oh, awesome, great. Okay, uh, let's see here. I think David Johnson was the one that had some interesting stuff. Okay, so he's a fisherman. Um, let's see what his observation was. This one he submitted an hour ago. Um, so, big image. So that's that was an hour ago. Um, so that's uh, what Christian did. He's, took a photo and put some observation in. He's probably the the, uh, the fisherman that does the most. Uh, let's see, let's see if I can, I should have saved his, uh, I think he's done a couple videos too. Um, okay, yeah, this is another good one here too. You can see people are actually commenting on here. I think this is a student. Um, yeah, some of these are students. Uh, Ruth, I believe, is a teacher um, or a scientist. And then the, uh, this is a school, or a teacher as well. So. Does that kind of give you a little idea on what we're doing? So, yeah. Okay, so how do you also ensure data quality? You know, the like 100 degree, you record 100 degree temperature on a summer day or something. Yeah. Know, uh, or an appropriate photo, video, upload kind of thing. How's that? Yeah, that certainly came so, up in conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so right now the content is, goes on there directly. They have to have a user account, so at least we know exactly who submitted. Um, you know, accounts are made that way. Um, People, administrators can go in and delete those things. Um, but there isn't like an approval process. You're right. So no one, right, but yeah, um, and then uh, on the data, you know, the data collection tool side, I think we do check things to make sure that it's not like 100,000 degrees. So, yeah. <coughs> when somebody's in offline mode when they're out, let's say, way out in the ocean, and they come back in, does it automatically upload or do they have to actually do something? They do have to go in and manually, you know, pick it from the list that they have on there. So um, it's not an automatic thing. Once again, it's kind of a, not a big deal. yeah, yeah. If it was a native app, you could do that. So, but we want to make something that was, you know, fast and cheaper. And so that was, in, yeah, I think we we're pretty happy with the results of that. That we used, so, yeah. yeah. What's, what's the difference between a native app and? Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, computer science background. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, native app would be something um, if you were going in and download something from a the App Store, if you're on an iPhone or the Google Play Store, um, that would be a native app. It's written specifically for that device. 
there's you know benefits of that. It's a little faster normally. You can access more parts of the phone. But a web app is something that works inside the browser. You know all your devices have browsers on them. So what it means is your code is just going to be written once. And you do have to tweak it to make sure the layouts look OK. Um, but for the most part, you can make it work on you know, everything. I mean, there are groups you have to jump through, but that's the differences. So. All right, one more question. Yeah, how old are the kids that you target this application for? Do um, they use their own cell phone? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure if they have cell phones, but uh, it's elementary school and middle school students. So, um, so they have, the classrooms have iPads, so they do hand, hand them out. Um, and sometimes they may just, you know, walk out and write on a piece of paper and then bring it in and enter it on, in on the computer. So um, the fishermen are definitely using smartphones. Um, it just makes a lot of sense for them to do it that way. Um, so different community members may use a smartphone, whereas kids probably don't have you know, phones. Oh, well, maybe they do. I don't know. <laughs> Can't say no for sure. Thank you, John. Yeah, that was very interesting. Next up, we've got um, Jeff Langell yep. and Matt Palmer. Jeff's from the State GIS office, and Matt is from Urban Anthony, from EA. And they're going to talk to us about the realistic 3D building modeling for using GIS and other software. So we'll give a minute when these guys get set up. And I want to a quick, quick response to Bob's question about the native app. Everybody's got the conference agenda app. It's on the iStore and the Play Store. Just hit the NY Geocon to get the native app. Good example of the conference agenda.
little bit about the data that we supplied Ehrman to, to start building these 3D models. Um, the first was unclassified LIDAR uh, point cloud, um, flown in 2008 as part of the New York State Digital Orchid Program at a 1.5 uh, nominal point spacing. It's semi-unclassified. It was classified as unclassified or bare earth. So we're, we're looking at just the ground or everything. And to build these three, 3D models, we had to separate into uh, all the other classes that Matt will cover later on in the presentation. Uh, stereo imagery um, flowed in 2011 at 6-inch. Um, we provided all the stereo pairs that covered both project areas that are in. This allows them to grab um, elevations, lengths, heights, widths, as well as other information that they can use for texturing purposes. The, the product of the stereo imagery was a uh, six inch resolution from uh, 2011, and then used this for texturing purposes as well as verification of the buildings. The digital frame model that is used to orthorectify the work imagery was also provided to Urban. They could use this to build a better dam that included break lines as well as other um, elevation information. And where we had imagery available, um, oblique imagery was provided. provided. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Matt for his part of the presentation on what he did with this data, and then I'll go back into how we used, reviewed and used this data. Right. Uh, so to create this 3D environment, uh, what we needed to do first was to create a digital elevation model that was high resolution and what was currently available, uh, high resolution in the 30 meter USGS. Um, so what we did was, the first step was to take that unclassified LiDAR that Jeff was talking about, which was, it was classified in four classes, zero, which uh, means the points were created, but they were never run through the, um, the filtering algorithm. Class one was points that were run through the algorithm, but then came back as unclassified. Two would be bare ground points, and then seven would be your noise points, which are points that were determined to be out of the realm of uh, possibility for that project site. So um, I had to take the 0 and 1 class and build them further into um, class 4, which is medium vegetation, uh, 5 high vegetation, 6 building, and then a 12 overlap with your bridge, bridge decks and um, elevated, or elevated um, roadways. And this will allow a user to do any kind of 3D analysis for either just the bare earth or they could also incorporate the vegetation and buildings into their uh, 3D analysis. Uh, we also wanted to incorporate the 3D break lines to make the um, digital elevation model more accurate. Um, so what we did was we used, uh, using that uh, existing stereo imagery, uh, we created in a DGN format 3D polylines, which represented uh, two foot or vertical, two foot or, two foot or greater vertical uh, elevation change. Um, we also incorporated pavement edges, sidewalk edges, um, swamps, wetlands, edge of water, and uh, elevation breaks, natural elevation breaks. Um, so we were able to take the, the bare um, ground LiDAR points and incorporate the 3D break lines, and we delivered to uh, the GIS program office two deliverables. One was a raster data set, which consisted of an image file at a one meter resolution. And we also delivered a, um, a vector data set, which was a ESRI 10, which consisted of um, 3D lines representing the uh, 10 lines. Uh, then we wanted to create the 3D buildings um, for visualization and uh, analysis. And there's uh, many ways to create these buildings. We decided for the state Harriman, the Harriman State Office building campus to um, use a more manual system because of the um, data we had and the uh, resources we had available. Um, so we took a, a data set that was provided to us by the GIS program office, which consisted of polygons for uh, the footprints of the buildings. And um, so we had updated this data because it was uh, like I think in 2008. Uh, so we took that those polygons and put them over the aerial imagery find buildings that weren't, um, didn't have footprints in 2008 to those um, footprints. And uh, 
this data set had um, attribute data attached to it, which um, had the top uh, elevation of the building and the base elevation of the building. And for the new footprints that we had to add, we uh, used LiDAR data to extract um, the base elevation and top elevation. And uh, using that, using those attributes, we could then extrude the 2D polygons into 3D polygons, convert that into a, a multi-patch in Esri, and then export that multi-patch to a lot of files, which allow us to manipulate the 3D shapes in a third-party modeling software. So this is the result of taking that footprint data and uh, using the attribute data to extrude it into a 3D shape. As you can see, what was helpful with this data set we had was not only had footprint data, but it also had um, polygons for um, features that were on top of the building, like uh, top story um, a portion of the building. So it made the modeling effort easier. We wouldn't have to start from scratch. So we, we uh, decided to use Trimble SketchUp to manipulate that generic shape um, to add more detail to it. And um, using pictometry, you could measure uh, the building heights and the lengths and widths of features. Um, and then we used the oblique imagery from pictometry and exported images that we could drape onto, onto the shape. And then where this imagery was obstructed, we could um, manually create our own texture or we could use stock textures from Trimble SketchUp, such as uh, brick facing and asphalt and concrete. So what we started with was a shape on the top, generic shape, and then you add detail and imagery to it to give a pretty accurate representation of the existing building. So we take those models that we built, that we modeled in SketchUp, bring them back into our scene or our globe, and replace the generic model with a new um, texture, uh, more detailed model. So here's, um, if you take the uh, digital elevation model that we made and drape the aerial imagery onto it and then add the 3D buildings, you can see you end up with a uh, pretty accurate representation of what the, the state, uh, the Harriman State Office Building campus looks like um, in real life. Uh, another aspect that the GIS program office wanted us to consider was vegetation. Uh, we kind of went back and forth on the best way to do this. Uh, we came up with two, two possible solutions. This one, um, this is more for visualization. We had a, a point file, file for each tree, and that file had attribute data for height and um, type, either deciduous or coniferous. So that allowed us to, in our scene or our flow, um, symbolize those trees with the correct height and with the correct type so you can see where trees exist on, on campus. Uh, the problem with, with this is it doesn't really work in a 3D analyst, uh, any kind of 3D analyzation, because it just recognizes these as points and not actual features. Uh, so another, we need to create 3D shapes for the, for the vegetation. Now, one way that we figured out to do this was to take um, we had polygons for groups of trees and the single points, and we buffered these shapes to, um, uh, so it, you, it would be a canopy, and we could take the LiDAR data that we had, the vegetation LiDAR, and um, interpolate a top surface to the, can the tree canopy, which would allow us to make these 3D shapes that we could use in uh, like a line of sight or a view shed analysis. Um, and back to Jeff. We went over some of this data. So the, the first data that we took when we got back was the request by letter data. And this is the the ground of everything we're working on. So we had to do a good QAQC uh, process on on the request by data. So the first thing I would do is I would take the LAS files and I would create a multi-point for each different class. And this screenshot you can see the red are multi-points for buildings, the gray is for um, bridge decks and elevated roadways. And then the two shades of green are the different vegetation, medium and high vegetation. And so what I would do is I would just load those multi-point features and pan through each project area that uh, pretty zoomed in so I could notice any outlying points that just didn't make sense. And these are a few that, that just don't make sense. And you may ask yourself, why is, why is if these cars are 
model that vegetation, what's the big deal? And it may not seem like a big deal, but if you're trying to do a viewshed analysis on from that parking lot, you're going to be obstructed right, in, right from the parking lot. So we need to go through and reclass all these points. In the top left image, you can see the detached garages are classified as vegetative. And so what I would do is I would just create a QA polygon and send it back to Matt and have those points reclassified. Um, the top right are some cars that were classified as, classified as medium vegetation. Another big problem were light poles and um, telephone poles, as well as traffic lights. They were being classified as vegetation. So I would just call all those points and have them reclassified as um, just unclassified. Or, so they wouldn't be included in the vegetation. And the bottom right, I don't know why, but they, they thought it was a building. Um, the second delivery to Lugava is actual 3D buildings, and if anybody's worked with <coughs> 3D buildings, they they are they take a lot of um, processing, so it's really slow in a 3D environment. So I found the quickest way was to just load the multi-patch file in, in a 2D environment and just pan through, pretty much similar to the LAS, how I reviewed the LAS, and no any buildings that were missing. And as Matt said. Um, the LiDAR was formed in 2008. These two buildings at the top top of the image were built after 2008, so they initially weren't modeled. Um, so Matt had to go in and um, use pictometry or other sources of imagery to get lengths, heights, and, and model those buildings from scratch. Uh, the bottom, you'll see a little circle around a small building in the middle of the campus, and this was this one was missed because it was just misclassified as vegetation. So once the was reclassified and he was able to model it. Um, the initial demo that we received was clipped to the footprint. Um, however, when you brought that into the 3D environment, overlaid the imagery in the buildings, you could see this data void was being sucked down. So the way that Erman fixed that was to bring in the dam, grab the base elevation of the buildings, and just fill in the footprint. And that would solve that. Uh, building textures. This was back and forth. It took us a while to figure out, but I think you contacted yeah, with the Resri, through the Resri, and it was just multiple faces on the building. So it was more noticeable in our scene and, and believe it or not, Google Earth, that when you pan around, all these faces were going gray and then back to the image, back to the image. And, but in, in our world, it was fine. And it just turned out to be multiple building faces that. And I was able to clear up through running through filter. Um, now we're going to talk about how how we go about analyzing this data that we got. And it's still we're still working on it, and there's still some issues that we're having. Uh, the first was a line of sight analysis. This is a line of sight analysis um, on the state office campus. And to do this, I created two dams: um, one with just buildings and ground, and then one with buildings, ground, and vegetation. And this is to simulate. A summer month with full tree canopy, you know, you can't see through trees because all the leaves. And then a winter month um, where you could you could still see through the trees. You know, your your vision might be semi obstructed through branches, but you should still be able to get a clean shot. Um, so on the top left of the left image, this is um, simulated simulating a summer month in full tree um, tree bloom. You can only see the green represents as far as you can see see up to the trees. And then you can't see onto the top of the building. Whereas in a winter month, when there's no leaves, you can see right through the branches and on, and the, on top of the building. Uh, a viewshed analysis through a third party software. Um, similar, this is all through the reclassified liar points. I built two dams one with trees, including the vegetation and bearer, and then one without trees. The, the left image represents a summer month with full leaf, and you can see up and down streets and just over the canopies, you can see the top of the buildings in the 3D view. And on the, the right image, where there's very little um, leaf, you can see more into the fields, the base of the buildings. Um, believe it or not, I could not get 3D buildings to work as a view shed in Esri. If anybody knows how to do that, please come to me. But uh, <laughs> myself and Matt, we went through it, and we couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, we were able to do in a global map, and so we're, although it doesn't show you the red on the face of the buildings, it shows you where on the den you can see. However, the, we were talking about trees. This, 
also a problem for us. The, the point data can't be used at all. The, the multi-patches were hit or miss, because you could see under some of them, you move over an inch and you can see way more. And it's just, we just don't feel comfortable saying that that's a true view shed at that point. Um, but this will, this will show uh, in a winter month with no vegetation. You can see north, all the red is represented. What you can see on the ground from a six foot elevation. I just, <coughs> average person is six foot, um, six feet, so it's each other. Um, <laughs> but the Where's the observation place? I'm sorry? Where's the observation? The observation is right in the middle of the field. You can see the little antenna right there. Okay. okay. Now, you can, uh, if anybody's familiar with the state office campus, there's a 10 foot retaining wall that drops down. So this person standing in the field won't there you, you won't be able to see them, you know below the retaining wall, but as you go further out you will be able to start seeing ground again across the fountains. And I work in this building and it's pretty pretty <coughs> accurate, you know. We walk that way every day and it's a pretty realistic representation. Um, now just some comparison screenshots. Uh, this is from Google Street View and in uh, bird's eye on the right, and then our actual model on the left. So you can see it's a pretty realistic rendering of what it actually looks like. Why not just another shot um, from also Google Street View and uh, bird's eye. Uh, that's the DC building on the left, and then the state. So I think it's uh, SUNY, yes. Um, any questions? How many person hours it took to create the, the It was building. easy for me because I had Matt to allow it, so, <laughs> to create the building. Yeah, the, the, what's the final building so that you can do some analysis? I don't have an exact number of hours. Hundreds? Hundreds of hours? We should indeed. state that uh, we both were brand new to this. I had never done any pre. I learned. Uh, sketch it by watching YouTube. You know, I learned it in a week. Not, I'm not an expert on it, but I could. I went from building a building in an hour to building a building in 10 minutes. And having a pretty accurate, you know, using pathometry to grab all the lane elevations, and also pathometry to um, trade plane injury or fit the basic. Uh, the more you do, I mean, that's way faster than I'm not even sure. I forget about uh two months worth of, of man hours. Yeah. Um, we decided for downtown Albany to use um, PLW. Um, they had a more automated system, but um, but the problem there was they own those actual models, and the state wanted to own the models outright, so I didn't use it. How large an area and just how, how many months to develop that model? It's around a mile, uh, one and a half square miles between both projects. And it, two months we were, I mean, yeah. myself, I, I was on and off. I was more on the front end and the back end of reviewing. And then, I mean, reviewing a LIDAR um, submittal took me a day or two. And then I would send my feedback back from that. Same with the building models. It, it wasn't that much. It's, it's more on that end. For, I mean, I, I work full time on the um, digital author program, so that's why I kind of handed it off. I guess my question is more oriented towards do you see developing a 3D model such as this a viable solution for other cities to invest in? This was a pilot project, and I, I think the focus is that we would like to build further models. Um, as time allows, and, um, and it, we just want to see, the, that's why we chose such a small area. And, I mean, it's not a small area, but downtown Olin is a lot of buildings. Oh, yeah. um, but we want to see what kind of data they could use for <coughs> urban and PLW, as well as, you know, some buildings have to be done from scratch, we didn't have LIDAR. Um, on the state office campus, the new Ag and Markets building isn't in, in imagery yet. so. We don't have it modeled yet, but it's it's in a geodatabase format. So as buildings become available, we can build those buildings and just put them in. We can replace <coughs> models if they had changes done to the face of them, or remove buildings if they get demolished. 
Did you consider using City Engine? City, uh, every City Engine. Um, we didn't, uh, for the Harriman campus, we didn't use City Engine. It was, that was easy enough to do the manual. And like I said, there's, there definitely is more automated ways to create these buildings. So that was just one uh, way that we decided to do it for the Harriman campus. So, uh, I looked into that City Engine. <coughs> Yeah, you, get, you do have some problems um, trying to fit them together because they're in sections, um, and then you got to try to put them on top of the dam. Um, that was one problem we had with PLW. And, uh, I'm not quite sure how they fixed it, but we'd bring it in to, um, and some of the ele elevated, they'd be up and down, but they did fix it. And That's another thing for, for Google versus Esri or, or a third party. The, placing those buildings on our dam, our one meter dam versus Google's, which is, I don't know, it's probably 10 meter. But the, the further you zoom in, you'll see those buildings float up and down because their their dam is constantly changing on based on how far you're out you are. So it's still trying to figure out some of those those problems because we can export these as KML and share them. But some of those buildings will be floating 10 feet above the ground. So. Thank you, Jeff. Man, I thought that was very interesting. I didn't see uh, state data sets that have been collected <coughs> being used in a slightly different manner. So I think that was very really interesting. Thank you. All right, next presenter is Mr. Bill Timmons uh, from GS Services. He's also a uh, sponsor and has a booth. Please feel free to stop and visit him. Uh, very interesting topic. Bill's going to prevent, uh, present is UAV for aerial photo mapping and event response. He's got a cool prop. He's got some nice uh, quad, there's a multi copter. I'm going to say quad copter out there by his booth. Um, pretty cool. You get a chance to check it out. fairly quickly so we can have a little bit more time for questions hopefully. Um, anyways, on the UAVs, the considerations we have for how many rotors we have or how many batteries we're going to put into these things, if, uh, if you're going to be working at basically how long you want to fly it for, your payload, and then a lot of other considerations in terms of how long you can fly are going to be the temperature and also the altitude uh, that you may be at. And my uh, slides are a little bit cut off here. <coughs> Volunteered my laptop. That's all right. Uh, so a UAV basically, we're not trying to. Uh, it's going to be flown autonomously, or you're going to be. Uh, so you'll have waypoints to send it out for. You always do your free pre plan flight plans, or you can fly it by yourself. Essentially, uh, how you identify an unmanned aerial vehicle is it doesn't have anybody on board flying the darn thing. So you're not up there with a, with a plane or a helicopter or whatever. Sorry. I was trying to be helpful. <laughs> I warned them, I guess. Fly at night? <laughs> yeah, we, we do some night flights actually with uh, Thermo for uh, some archaeology projects we're doing down in Mexico. So at night, during the day, the, temp the ground heats up at different uh, temperatures, and if there's an a subsurface rock structure, like a rock wall or a pyramid that's been buried or a stone home, at night, uh, these geometric shapes just kind of stand out. So it's kind of like ground penetrating radar, but not really. So the, the heat coming back up is going to uh, show you the different features on the ground.
in somebody's computer, I promise I might return it. Oh, uh, yeah, I need a new one. Or, or 
maybe a hazardous material spill. And we also have uh, working with the American Society of Safety Engineers and look at and different types of sensors that we can put on there for radiation or maybe benzene or ammonium nitrate or, or whatever. I don't know what these substances are that may have spilled out of a truck, but it's certainly a lot easier to send one of these up and determine an area than it is to go in and try to figure out, uh, you know, by sending somebody walking around the area with a hand sensor. Uh, Air photo right now, because these things are only flying, say, for a 20-minute battery life at a time, depending on the number of rotors, the weight of what you're carrying, and again, the altitude and temperature during that day, Smaller areas are, are better for the air photo mapping applications. Um, if you want to, it's recommended that you get a training copter. Now, we used to make a training copter that was sold for like $1,000. Now you can go out and buy these little things for like 75 bucks at a hobby store that basically have the same controls. The only difference is, is when you let go of the controls, the thing crashes. If you're using one of the ones that are designed for air photo mapping or event response, when you let go of the controls, it either continues along the path that you've designated it to go on, or it'll hover at that location. Uh, this was a uh, setup that we used with a 20 megapixel uh, Samsung camera uh, for some mapping applications for Maricopa County flood control, and I will, uh, will show you that a little bit later. But uh, essentially, we got some great results from that. And you can have typical photos, you know, overhead, or you can have the oblique photos. We went out to the agriculture guys, and you always think you know what they want. They want to know about their crops. No, they want an oblique photo of their farm that they can put up on the wall. So sometimes <laughs> the reason that people want things are different than what you anticipate them for. Uh, when we went to put the uh, ARC Info at the city of Jacksonville, Florida, the supervisor guy approving it, he really didn't like it too much. You know, he was, oh, gee, I have mapping and stuff. But there was a party that day, and we made a, a banner from it that said, Happy Birthday. He calls, well, how'd you do that? We go, we did it with our kids. He goes, we want that. That's nice. <laughs> you know, so the guy's spending, you know, some outrageous amount of money because you like the Happy Birthday sign more than the GIS. So you anticipate people's needs. Sometimes it's better to listen to people and what they want than it is to try to tell them what they need. So we step back from it, and maybe, you know, your county commissioners or anybody overseeing why we don't want these darn things up there. Uh, might have a reason that they want it, and that, that would be a good entry point for you. Uh, flight times, again, I mentioned about 15 to 20 minutes with the copters. And again, there's different ways that you can uh, view things, either on a, a screen in a command center, on a, maybe in a vehicle for uh, emergency response, or you can also have goggles, first-person view, that you can wear and, and see what the, actually see maybe possibly two cameras on it, one for where you're going and another camera for the sensor to point down to what you're looking for. Uh, this was an example for Maricopa County Park Control I mentioned using that 20 megapixel Samsung camera. Uh, we had two flights for this to capture 30 different locations. So we put in uh, 15 waypoints at a time and then flew the darn thing. Come up with post-processing capabilities, uh, do your surface modeling. We were flying at 100 feet. Uh, we used Photo Modeler to actually process all the information. And we got, uh, at 100 feet and 25, 35 mile per hour winds, uh, we got six millimeters in vertical elevation accuracy. So these things can be, can be pretty good. And I don't know what's going to happen when we put the LiDAR unit on the darn thing. Um, there are a lot of plug and play modules that you can get from a company called DGI in Austin, Texas, if you're looking to build your own. And they have all these capabilities. So the return to home is, is good. Uh, we didn't set it up quite right the first time. And the uh, six rotor unit came back and the guy's watching it. And unfortunately, he had stepped into the landing zone from where the thing took off. So uh, 32 stitches later at the hospital, he found out that he should have been, he saw it coming back and he was seeing it coming to hit him, but he didn't realize he had to move out of the way. <laughs> so now we've modified this. So the darn thing comes back. It hump, and it, it, if it loses signal, it knows it needs to come home. Or if you pull a switch back, it knows it needs to come home. So it comes back, hovers about 20 feet above your head, and then slowly comes down and gives you time to get out of the way. And you can't hear the four-rotor one at, at about 50 to 75 feet in an urban environment. But when it's 20 feet above your head, you're going to hear it, and you're going to know you need to move if you've happened to step into the, the area where you, where you need to go. Again, there's all these different types of control functionalities you can have, whether you're using uh, you know, your iPad or your computer for programming it or for all your waypoints. So it's a lot of capabilities with that. 
Um, for events, again, tablets, phones, computers, different ways to, to view what's going on out there. Um, and then you can obviously you can manu manage it manually, manually control it for situational awareness situations. Uh, so if you're, uh, when we look at the ones that we're building for the uh, Arizona County Terrorism Information Center, they wanted a backpack. <coughs> they wanted to be able to strap a four-unit road around the back of the backpack and walk into where they wanted to go. But they also wanted a variety of pre-programmed flight plans already there. And Arizona, everything is not like it is here. And here you may need a compass to know whether, which direction you're going at. Uh, there, uh, you know, you get out of the car, you know that's north, that's south, that's east-west. So you can push a button, up the thing goes, 75 feet, over 100 feet. Now you can see how long the chain is, the dog's out in the backyard, or where the guy is with the gun, possibly, if you're working with a SWAT team. Uh, so this was the, there's the goggles you can see down in the, in the right-hand corner, and also the controls. Uh, we did a uh, historic preservation for uh, Superior, Arizona. And right now, because we don't, uh, commercial applications aren't capable of charging for these things, uh, everything we're doing now is free. Uh, but if you want us to come and do it for you, we would hope that you would pay for our transportation. But uh, we're happy to try to get some uh, proof of concepts out there for all different types of applications. Uh, this is a unit that we built for going out for agriculture and vineyards. And this is the only one that we're mass producing. Everything else is custom made based on your requirements. So whether you need headers and material sensors, or whether you need any, like just a GoPro camera or video, or you want one of the units where you can strap a transponder on your belt, and the things, and you're walking an outdoor event, the things going to follow you around up above you. And again, we have uh, cameras that run anywhere from $100 to $14,000, depending on what you want to use. Or the uh, now, you know, we were going to—I was going to say the lidar sensor, which was $30,000. Now it's ten. So the camera we have for 14, with the 360-degree view, uh, is probably the most expensive camera that we're currently flying. And that one has uh, servos on the landing gear, so the landing gear goes up, so it doesn't obstruct the 360-degree view. And with that, I can go for questions, and I probably have about two or three minutes here. So, yes, sir. I'm wondering about sensors. Can you uh, tell what your tilt or <coughs> there's uh, yes, there's a uh, and there's also gimbals on the uh, actual uh, cameras or sensors to focus them, point them in the direction. So you can crab sideways with the thing, or you can you know you can move it around however you want. a gyro and again I don't know but I could uh, the folks that, uh, that build the darn things for me uh, I'm doing the marketing side of things but the actual technical people are up in Phoenix and I'm in Tucson and we have our research facility there and uh, we're finding that what we're building is generally about one-fifth to one-tenth of the cost of say the hundred dollar hammer so we're trying to sell a ten dollar hammer and uh, we know we're going to have a lot of trouble doing that because we are not north of Grumman and all these other people that are already have all the contracts in place and the mechanisms for sale. So that's why we're willing to go places and do things for free right now until we have the capability to charge for services or to uh, sell the product so that you can use it in the field. Yes? Um, at some point, these things pretty much just fly themselves, right? You can program some flight plan to yes. start. Yeah, you can program flight plans for search and rescue, and, or you can go in and program them for your data capture for your photo mapping. Right, so it would be 100% on the yes. uh, Well, right now, the Federal Aviation Administration requires that for a certificate of authorization, you need to show a pilot. Um, we're trying to meld the recreational use with the current use for authorizations for public entities so that when commercial applications become available or able to fly into 2014, beginning of 2015, that it's not so restricted, especially if the thing is all pre-programmed. And public safety, you know, if we have 30 units, which the uh, Counterterrorism Fusion Center wants in Phoenix for the metro area, uh, those guys, all we want them to do is be able to take it out of their car, put it down on the ground, let it go. For uh, uh, tailings and stuff like that, for uh, Peabody uh, Coal or for Freeport Macaran, 
they would run the same program every day. They take it out, set it on the ground, it goes up, comes back, it collects. And now for the, the cost of what they're doing, two flyovers in a month, they can do the entire year every day, which is what they really need because they're pulling in for pulling the material out, putting it back in on a daily basis. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Okay. Um, Richard. <laughs> um, kind of pink. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's okay. Salmon. It's okay. Yeah, no, salmon. Salmon. Okay, go, go. I like salmon. <laughs> All right, salmon. <laughs> salmon. Real men can wear pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious with like collision. Like, is there anything to help prevent it from like if you have two of these things interacting? Is there any sort of way? Uh, you we uh, you look for a company that you're going to be working with um, that will provide you a replacement option for a certain amount per year. <laughs> uh, and uh, right now, our replacement option doesn't cover water. So if you dump the thing in an estuary or something like that, you're kind of out of luck. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yes? Uh, if you're flying it and it's run low on battery, does it know to return itself? Or uh, you can set it for returning itself. It knows but, the amount of time it takes to get that. Yeah, well, you can also have a sensor on there that lets it know when the battery uh, is running low. Uh, you just have to, con the thing flies, all these things that we're flying right now go about 45 miles per hour, so we can get away from you fairly quick. Okay. <laughs> yes? Would it be a little risky to attach, like, say, a $10,000 LiDAR sensor on one of these? And that well, would be, seem to be quite risky. Yes, uh, that's why the $14,000 camera we have, that's uh, NC Technologies, it's, it's called an iStar. 360-degree uh, view. Right now, we've never flown the camera, but we've flown a plastic model with the same weight. We've not had <laughs> trouble with it. But we're concerned that if, this, if the thing crashes and the, and the landing gear doesn't come down to brace the crash with the servos. So the key to that is practice. And, you know, I, I talk to helicopter pilots and helicopters crash, planes crash. You know, these things are going to crash. So just be aware of where you are. We, right now, we don't like to go into a, an environment where there's a lot of people. We'll fly agricultural products, we'll, we'll do historical preservation, uh, we'll do trails, we'll do utility lines, corridor planning. Uh, but we've kind of stayed away from you know, going to a, a public event and flying one of these things with the transponder up above you to see what's going on underneath. Uh, our liability issues and insurance, we don't want to test them. And uh, there's a lot of people out there now that are, are, are trying to force the FAA administration into making changes, and then we don't know where it's going to go with our insurance policies as well. We have time for a couple questions. Okay. And, and I have a booth, too, in the... Uh, yeah, maybe this is a booth question, but what are you using for your flight planning software, and will that allow you to do stereo pairs? <laughs> um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I don't know what they're, what they're using for their flight plan. The uh, Sunsfly product does it uses the Fix 4D software. It does allow you to do stereo pair with it. Yeah. So we do have the capability then with the fixed wing. Uh, fix yeah. yeah. But I'm right. not sure that whatever we have in the fixed wing, we we can make it available in the copters as well. Yes. What's the effective uh, highest elevation they'll fly? Uh, it'll go so you can't see it anymore. Uh, and you're not supposed to fly it out of line of sight. 400 feet is supposedly the ceiling that the FAA will allow you to fly. Okay. But I know the University of Texas, I was just there in Austin last week, and they were flying at 1,900 feet doing salt brush uh, studies and also looking for feral pigs, which are apparently a big problem there in Texas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill has a booth. Uh, extremely interesting topic. Prices are dropping, quality is improving. A lot of actually a lot of the military technology is coming down into commercial space in Europe. They don't have the FAA, and this stuff is taking off like wildfire over there. In Mexico, we're doing archaeology projects down there. No restrictions. Canada, no restrictions, almost at all. So but when the U.S. is lagging behind. In when it gets to the U.S., I think I think Bill had a very good observation. It's going to catch and it's going to catch fast and um, certified pilots type of thing is is going to be an interesting market to be in. Um, thank you very much. Please visit Bill. Our last speaker uh, is uh, Mr. James Maher from uh,
the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Albany. And it's going to talk to us about automated pen and ink landscape illustrations. It's a little bit of a different take, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Keep talking. Um, you can stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Oh. Oh, well, thanks very much for coming. Uh, it, it's an honor to be following all these really interesting and useful applications. The only thing I can do is present a totally useless application. <laughs> uh, I've been really interested for a long time in the really great landscape illustration artists from the late 19th to the you know, mid 20th century. Uh, people like well, originally, this kind of tradition really started back with uh, Da Vinci's landscape paintings, which were the first to actually involve artistic perspective. But you also have a tradition coming in from the Swiss cartographers of the 16th century, who really weren't cartographers, but really were, were illustrators. And the illustrations were done on woodcuts. And so you get these you know, obvious kind of woodcut uh, symbology through here simply by gouging a piece of wood, inking over the surface, putting paper on the top, and that's you know one of the few ways you can really come up with an image that is uh, easily replicable. Well, <clears throat> going up into the, well, for Davis, the mid to late 19th century, going to the early 20th century, and uh, going out to the exploration of the American West and the great expeditions in the 1880s and so on, out to Utah, Arizona, Grand Canyon, district and so on. There are a lot of interesting artwork created for that, uh, <coughs> doing these pen and ink style diagrams. I'm sure you guys have all seen these things. The thing that really characterizes these kinds of diagrams are kind of the simplicity of the artwork, using a, a relatively few number of lines to get a really representative landscape, which I think is, is really cool. They're not noisy images. They're just, just the opposite. A good image in this tradition ought to have just enough lines and no more. Uh, other things that you see here is even in Imhoff, but uh, Edward Imhoff is a Swiss cartographer who worked, was active up into at least the 60s or so, maybe a little bit beyond that, uh, 1960 that is. Uh, Esri, uh, a number of years ago, took one of his great uh, publications and updated it, uh, translated it finally into a readable English translation. Uh, but that book, if, if for nothing else, has just great uh, pen and ink style illustrations in it and has a lot of good information for uh, all kinds of landscape representation of all different kinds of uh, approaches. What I wanted to do, because I was interested in this stuff, was to replicate what those guys did <clears throat> by starting with DEMs, doing surface analysis of various kinds, and then essentially creating line drawings from them in this style. I originally did it just because I was interested in doing it and seeing if I, could, if I could do it. And then lately, I uh, started working with uh, some people in the uh, field geology community who are still making field sketches for this kind of stuff and are interested in, well, you know, it takes me forever to do one of these things, can I automate it? And it turns out, yeah, you, you can do that. Okay, well, just to talk about this briefly for a sec, for a moment, the kind of line work that I'm doing are these so-called silhouette kinds of lines, and you can imagine, well, if you're driving in this area, you can see the Adirondacks off in the distance. Silhouette is just the boundary between, well, the edge of the terrain and the sky. But if you want to model something like that, using a DEM, well, you can think about the silhouette as representing a division between a face of the hillside that you can see and another one that you can't see, that dividing line is, well, your silhouette line. Of course, people like Davis and Imhoff and Holmes and those people out in the West uh, didn't really think about it that way. One of the interesting things about doing this kind of stuff is you really have to think like a painter, you have to think like an illustrator. You can't just take a DEM, uh, and I'm sure we've all used DEMs rendered in triangles or grid cells or whatever, and hope to do this on the base type of surface. If we use all of the samples on the DEM to do this kind of stuff, we end up with all kinds of problems with noisy surfaces. So if we, the denser and denser we sample, the more and more noise we get. So it's an interesting problem. We're kind of reversing what's been the modern trend uh, with DEM to sample more and more and more. We're talking here about you know, uh, you know 
six inch sampling or submeter sampling. And uh, I'm going the other way. I'm actually uh, taking high resolution DEMs and then creating surface models from them that create appropriate looking silhouettes like that, but not this kind of stuff. I don't want to uh, have line work that appears in my penalty models that, although you could say, yeah, 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 this, this surface act is actually, this triangle is facing the line of sight. There's a little one down there that's not draw a line. No. Uh, no real artist would do something like that. <clears throat> Artists interpret the surface and they throw out stuff that they don't like and put stuff in that they do like. So the application has to do the same thing. So this application is all written in C++. <coughs> I do all of the graphics in OpenGL, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. To smooth out the surface, to get rid of all those things, what I've been doing is using uh, Bezier surface models, usually stitched together as these blinds of some kind or other. Uh, the great thing about this is this is a very uh, early technique in uh, automated cartography for rendering DEMs. Back in the 60s, for example, when uh, you know, memory was exorbitantly expensive, but computing time, well, you we could get away with using the machine for quite a long time. You could take an area, uh, sample it uh, sparsely uh, with control points, and then construct uh, smooth bicubic polynomial surfaces through them. So essentially, by using those control points or elevation samples of the little spheres around there, you can create a nice smooth surface that will be smooth at any resolution that you care to zoom in on. One of the problems with Bezier surfaces is that you, if you uh, keep increasing the order of the surface, uh, I'm using cubic order, if you keep on going with that, well, you're your evaluation times increase exponentially with the number of control points that you've got, and that can be a problem. However, there is a very nice technique now for creating Bezier surfaces just based on triangles, which I'll talk about at the end, called PN triangles. It's a really neat technique. These blinds take individual Bezier chunks of a surface, stitch them together with any uh, any degree of continuity that you want, 0, 1, 2, I use uh, second order uh, connectivity between ones that have forgotten. And I don't bother going through all this junk here. But you end up with uh, lots of little B spines all stitched together. And basically, when you look at the image, you can't, you can't see the stitching, which is the important thing. Now, another important thing about this project, it's not, not creating surfaces that are suitable <coughs> for hydrological analysis in the, in the sense that we're going to be building flood maps or floodplain models from this. It's all illustration, and that's what I'm really going for here. What does it look like? Does it look good? Now, does it look like somebody drew it? So I want to be able to take a tin surface like this, for example, and extract the silhouettes from it like that. That's only part of the problem. Surface tessellation means, of course, that, well, we can get a DEM already tessellated into grid cells or tessellated into triangles. What if you zoom in on the surface? You want the tessellation to increase. Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do it in a way that's somewhat realistic? If we take a DEM, this is a DEM that was, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, from uh, Utah in the uh, Zion National Park, very southern Utah, uh, just north of uh, Arizona, right on that border. Uh, this is rendering that surface using just these beast lines. And it's not very attractive. It looks like walking into a haunted house with uh, drapery over the furniture or something. It's not really a great surface model, but that's just the base. That's what I'm rendering from. That's my, uh, my base of my toolkit. So to do all this stuff, uh, I've been using OpenGL as my 3D rendering software, Seagal, which is a great open source geometry library, and this is all, again, written in C++. Now, one of the things about doing this stuff, even though OpenGL, DirectX, and so on are, are set up to do real-time animation, is that uh, the original model for this is very slow. It will take sometimes maybe five minutes to create an individual frame. Obviously not animation speed, but I'll address that again. Now this is what I was talking about with pulling out silhouettes before. 
And so if we take a look at an image like this, this is the image now with silhouettes actually on the, on the back. So when I'm creating these things, I actually render the whole model, but I render the surfaces in white, pull out the silhouettes, render them in black. So the silhouette masks the stuff in the back, or the surface masks the stuff in the background and we don't get any weird see-through kinds of effects. Form lines are lines on the surface that are important to draw from any point of view, whether you're standing here or here. And so things like ridges, valleys, and so on are important to render that way. And so in this kind of a thing, we talk about the surface having a slope component. It's tilt above the base plane, which would be this angle. Now we'll see we have an illumination component. Where's the light source coming from? So these two uh, elements have to blend together to show what the surface would look like as a pen and ink type of artist would draw it. Uh, also, another thing that I do to use the line work is I actually create drainage accumulation models. These can be really, really dense. So I also have ways of taking the models and stripping out things like first, second, or third order streams. Uh, there's also other ways to do it too. So here, in this particular model, the form line renderings would look something like that. Uh, and you can see, well, I've got an animation going in a second, that these really are uh, essentially drainage accumulation lines. Okay, so there's a whole bunch. There is a giant slew of rendering parameters in here. This is actually part of the problem of this program. Where I'm going with this is trying to essentially create an expert system that could automatically figure out how to illuminate a surface depending on things like slope, altitude, position of the observer, and so on. Okay, in this particular one, um, let's see, I think I got to actually click here and make this one. This is an animation of how the model holding it. <laughs> oh. It's going off my flash drive, so you never know. Oh, oh. Well, I'm going to give up on that. Oh, there it goes. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like that commercial with Bill Cower, you know, that poor woman was trying to finish her exercise routine on, on Wi-Fi. Uh, anyway, well, you can see what I'm doing here. I'm rotating a light source around, and let me get that out. Stop, 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 stop. Oh, I won't try that again. Okay, we can do the same thing here with uh, doing uh, zoom in and zoom out. You just have to imagine what this looks like. But as we're moving in towards the surface, we can keep, including, keep increasing the level of detail. Now, the images were not done in real time. This is a, essentially a, uh, an animated GIF of uh, about 72, or in this case, 100 images that were uh, essentially let the thing run overnight and compile this stuff. However, what I'm getting into now is using uh, modern versions of OpenGL using uh, uh, what are called shading languages that actually run on the GPU. That allows you to keep all of your data processing on the GPU, no transferring on the system bus, which is what really slows stuff down. <coughs> also, what I'd like to do is to get more of <coughs> the Davis style of modeling. And so what I was doing recently was working with uh, Rudy Salim when was down at Penn State doing some uh, work with sketches uh, or with DEMs up in the Labrador. Uh, the work that he does is very, very low relief. It's really interesting. The actual relief in these scenes is maybe a couple of meters at most. So we're working with a 10 times vertical uh, exaggeration here. And it actually is starting to pull out the nice little drainage channels that are actually along the beaches. And it's been kind of fun to, to do that. So I'm considering when I'm moving on here to you know, start to actually think of some practical applications. Uh, right now, though, uh, these images take a long time to, uh, to generate, so my current work is to switch over 
to a modern OpenGL using shader programs. And now I'm doing silhouettes in just about real time. So about, I would estimate right now about 20 frames per second. Currently working on doing the form line stuff, which is harder because there's more stuff to do. I have to figure out how much drainage networks to actually involve in this, and that's pretty much it. So thank you. From beginning to end, like to to create an actual image. Yes. Uh, some of those are about, the Utah ones are about five minutes. Uh, I've got some. No, I mean to write the code, write the code. like the whole. <laughs> no, the whole process. Uh, it's a it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, C++ is a great language for writing code, and it, it works out really well. It, it's a it's a brutal language, and you make mistakes. There's a lot of mistakes. Place to make. The worst part about that is not so much the C++ side. Moving to the GPU programming side, there are no debuggers. And so you either have to write the code perfectly, which is generally impossible. Uh, the only way you can debug code like that is to have little if statements in your GPU code that says, if this happens, turn the screen red. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you wrote something wrong with that code. And then usually what happens is your application just crashes start over again. It's, it's a little bit frustrating. You get kind of better at it as you go along. Yeah. I if you experimented with different types of EM, LiDAR versus... Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. In fact, the, the highest resolution DEMs I've used are 10 meter, and 10 meter is too high uh, because you run into problems where you have a... I'm using a frame buffer right now, 512 by 256 pixels, and... Uh, with some of the current work I'm doing, I have to actually have multiple frame buffers. So it runs, you start running into a lot of pixels, and then each pixel has a uh, back of data sources or <coughs> giving information for, uh, well, for example, each pixel might have a surface normal associated with that particular pixel. So that's three or four components right there. And it gets, it gets it's pretty data greedy right now. And one, one thing I'm working on is trying to make it less greedy. fixed pipeline model where you basically put points in one end and they come out the other end. In the modern <coughs> GP, in the modern uh, shading type of language, you have a vertex processor followed by two tessellation processors, followed by a geometry processor, and finally a fragment processor, all of which use programming languages which are variants of C, they're all slightly different. And so uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's I want to sit quietly for a while before you hop in the car. <laughs> you want to drive an anger down the north lane. <laughs> yeah. Great one in the back. Yeah. Jim, um, yeah. I think this is, I can sort of see this being incorporated into a kind of a standard you know, geospatial software package. Do you have visions of that? I mean, I yeah, I've, 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 I've talked with people about, you know, applications of just the image side of it. And uh, I was talking with somebody from from uh, Essary a while back. Uh, blanking on her name. Uh, a well-known person who attends a lots of conferences. <laughs> Thank you, uh, who said that you know there was some call for, like for example, in hiking maps and stuff, you know, to create a picture of what, what it looks like from there. I see it as a lot more than that. I do too. I mean, just in terms of the general visualization, I mean, I would argue that this rendering of the landscape is more intuitive. Yeah. Well, the one, the thing about uh, that kind of a line work, for example, right now, slide here is that in a pen and ink style diagram, almost <laughs> always the four lines represent lines of steepest slope. So they're almost always connected with some kind of drainage based analysis or visualization. Uh, I was also working with a guy down at uh, West Point a couple of years ago. We were just chatting about this kind of stuff. 
they send their cadets out into an area of the West Point campus to do uh, essentially you know, real-time orienteering things. So they start people out one location and they're judged on whether they actually get to the final location, but more importantly, if they follow the right path. So a lot of what they do is field interpretation of things like, okay, turn left at the spar, so they have to know what spar is and so on. What we were thinking would be interesting if they had this kind of a representation in real time that you know, people could actually use. That's kind of cheating, but at least you could use it for training purposes. So yeah, I'm really shooting to have this as a real time fly through kind of an application. And that's getting there. I'm going to put together a paper now just for the silhouette part of that. And then another paper after that, which will be the form lines. And hopefully by that time, the whole thing will be working in real time. Yeah. What got you interested in doing this at all? Uh, I just like those pictures. <laughs> I, I just love those old diagrams. Uh, William Henry Holmes is really the kind of the king of that. The Henry Mountains in Utah are actually named after him. It's kind of neat. He started out as a uh, illustrator at uh, the Smithsonian Institute. He was kind of discovered by um, uh, uh, not Davis, but uh, oh, that guy from Mount Morris, Mount and Geneseo people here. <laughs> uh, there's a guy from Mount Morris whose name I'm also blanking on, who was uh, one of the big uh, pioneers. Powell. Powell. Powell, yeah, going down the uh, Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, and uh, Henry, William Henry Holmes went on the Powell expeditions out there to do uh, landscape illustrated, just beautiful stuff. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you to take a look at those pictures just because they're fun to look at. Yeah, that's what I'm shooting for. I'm shooting high. Thank, thank you for thank everyone coming. We have a, uh, a 30 minute break and then followed by a general assembly in the uh, expo hall for the association meeting. Please attend.